Okay, welcome to another edition of Pulp Nonfiction. Today we'll be talking to uh, Professor Stephen Bunker from Alabama. Stephen and I were high school grads at Richmond Colts back in the previous century. We won't name the year, but never mind. And then we both went to UBC and um, you did, uh, you started off undergrad history and then you went um, up honors history at UBC and, and you stayed on and got your master's at UBC in history um, under the tutelage of Bill French, I believe. And, That's sorry? That is correct. Oh, perfect. And, yes. and then you went down to Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, behaved very well there. So good that they let me go to Dallas to do my undergrad. They didn't ban Canadians from going down there, which is great. So neighboring cities. And then uh, you got your PhD in history there. You specialize primarily in Mexico. Uh, Mexico is your subject, is that right? Correct. Um, the degree is actually Latin American history, but my specialization was post-independence, so 19th and 20th century Mexico. Okay, yeah. okay. And uh, after graduating with your PhD and finishing, sorry, finishing a PhD program, you're, you uh, moved to Alabama and you've been there for a number of years since? Since um, 2006. Since 2006. Roll Tide, right? <laughs> <laughs> Roll Tide. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so what we're chatting about is a little bit um, how the COVID pandemic has um, uh, affected you in Alabama. And um, I know there's also a poignant family story there if you want to mention that as well. And then um, also how, because you're, you're very tuned into uh, Mexico and Central America, maybe speak to that a little bit. Um, and I think you've got some very interesting points that uh, others would love to hear. Okay, well, sure. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here, Joel. This is really a pleasure to catch up with you and, yeah. and to, uh, speak to this since we've all been socially isolating. So um, this is this is great. Um, so so here in Alabama, so I, I teach at the University of Alabama, and how this worked was. The, the timing of it, you'd had the buildup throughout f February and March and, and uh, President Trump, I guess, uh, had said this was all a hoax or it's going to pass. And you could tell it was building up and spring break started around March 13th. And it was already just a few days before there was a lot of talk that we might not be coming back or that they were gonna extend spring break. While we were uh, on spring break, they decided to turn it into a two week spring break and then come back and everything would be online. So during that spring break, I headed off to Nicaragua and the world completely transformed when I came back a week later. So, when I had left, I had already told my students, they had had some assignments turned in. I said, look, we're likely not going to come, come back immediately at that time. It may be online, we'll transition everything. But we were still talking about having possibly one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings on campus or whatever else, that was completely gone. So it was a real, I think things got really rushed at the university and elsewhere as everybody throughout the university academic world and the universities tried to figure out, should we close? Are we exaggerating too much? And you started seeing like Ohio State and Stanford. And then finally when Auburn went to saying that we're not going to be coming back, Alabama switched in. So it was really, what you ended up seeing was a lot of indecision in the US in universities because of a lack of guidance um, among political leadership. And this, it has become very politicized here about whether the coronavirus was really a thing or not. Like you saw this idea that it was just a China thing. And, and I think that has caused a lot of confusion here and made it really difficult to respond because it of that indecision at the top and people didn't want to be taking the lead if it might lose them revenue or prestige etc so so i got to say it's been chaotic here 
And but I do think that the university has a pr done a pretty good job of getting things ready afterwards and providing support to faculty. One of the things that UA has benefited from is that since 2011, when a big tornado sliced through Tuscaloosa, which had never happened before, I mean, you'd get winged by it, but the university has been put in uh, emergency preparedness for exactly a situation like that. So everything has been transferred over. Some people are using Zoom. There are various other ways, but the university has been good. So my professional life has actually worked out pretty well and I'm grateful to have a paycheck and to be able to at least continue um, this here. So that's the university. I think when it comes to local level you and, and state level, so I live in Tuscaloosa, which has a population of about 120,000. There's another town right next to it. We've kind of absorbed it and it's about another 30,000. So it's about 150,000 in total. The university makes up, uh, there's about 40,000 people at the university. So when university is in session, we're like 190,000, which is really important for the economy. But even despite that, I've been really impressed by our mayor, Walt Maddox, because he's taken this really seriously and said, shut things down. So Tuscaloosa and Birmingham, the largest city in the state, um, have done really push the social distancing, closing down um, non-essential businesses. It's been great. They've done what they can. But there's a lot of popular opposition to that. And our governor is one of the governors who hasn't done anything without a lead from President Trump. And so again, it's this mixed message which has caused a lot of issues. Um, when I left for... Nicaraguan spring break, the airport was a little, little less busy than normal, but it was still busy. When I flew back nine days later, there were about eight cars on the parking deck floor that usually has normally about 900. Wow. Um, it was really like coming back to a ghost town. And my wife, who is Nicaraguan, she was staying down there because she was spending time with her family because it's been a while since she's been able to come back. She was supposed to come back on April 11th. We tried to get her back, uh, change her ticket while I was down there. The American Airlines website wouldn't let you change the ticket. You could get to the very end and then it stopped. Anyways, fast forward. Um, the airport in Managua, they, they don't have regular uh, office hours. So, so we couldn't do anything and, and until the day that I was leaving on Sunday the 23rd. She came, obviously, with me because uh, she, her family lives about an hour and a half away. So came in and we we're going to change the ticket there. So this is Sunday. The ticket agent says, oh, well, actually, we can't change anything because it's Sunday now. American just announced today, Thursday is the last day that they will fly out of Managua. Now, there was no government mandate on this at all. They did this unannounced. And she said, and there is nothing left in terms of seats until Thursday. And we're like, so what are you going to do? And my wife is flying business class, too. And there's been no announcement. She says, well, we can get you out since your business class will get you on the first fl flight once it's scheduled to resume. When's that? May 7th. Wow. <laughs> so, so we think this is, we're, we're just, my wife is just going to tough it out. And a week before, mm -hmm. Nicaragua had uh, just had its first confirmed case of coronavirus. So Nicaragua had not mm. had anything confirmed until that point. And already the last couple of days, people were starting to hoard, even though the government, when we can talk about, didn't, hasn't responded very uh, forcefully at all to this. And in fact, has pulled kind of like a Trump or a Bolsonaro in Brazil, which has been to kind of poo poo it and see it as a political ploy against them. Anyways, so about two hours after I get through security, my wife um, was. 
I said, check any other airline. And apparently United said that they will fly until, would fly until April 1st. So the following Monday or Tuesday, I think it was. Um, and they had three business class tickets left. That was it on the Sunday, the 29th. And so, so she would fly from uh, Managua to, to Houston, Houston to Birmingham. So we're like, are you sure they're gonna fly? And they said, yes, they're swearing that they will fly. So she gets to the airport and, or the day before she's scheduled to leave, mm -hmm. they cancel the flight from Houston to Birmingham mm. and they don't give her an alternative. And she's trying to contact United and both their website and their office in Managua are not working. So she gets to the airport and I'm thinking, I'm gonna have to drive from Tuscaloosa to, to Houston, which is just under a thousand kilometers um, and pick her up. Mm -hmm. And so fortunately, well, they couldn't do anything in Managua at the airport, but when she was in flight, I got a message that they were able to finally get her one ticket onto the last flight into Huntsville, Alabama, which is about two hours or about an hour north of Birmingham, about two hours from here. So I went to go pick her up on Sunday night um, and they were the only people in the airport, just complete ghost town. Wow. And so the Birmingham airport, it is still open but I don't know what flights are coming in because they're, they've canceled most of them. And so, so that's just a, a personal tale of how this has gone. Uh, it is, it has really been pretty nerve wracking. Um, so, so that's what's happened here. In, in terms of medical response here, it was really slow. They only about a week and a half ago, they started up drive-by testing. Mm -hmm. Things were really set back because over half of the first tests that were done turned out to be ineffective. Um, and so it's like, come on, Alabama. Everybody's like, what are you doing? But things seem to have gotten be better. We've gotten uh, messages from, from dentists to office saying that they've had to cancel, that they would reschedule cleanings, for example, they would try and start up again in early May. Um, I don't know much else about the, the, the uh, uh, dentistry and, and how it's affected dentists down here, but, but they've pretty well shut down. And then with the doctor's offices, most of them have shut down and are doing um, t uh, video, video calls and stuff like that. So they have tried to adapt to that. So. Um, but, but Alabama, I think, is the coronavirus has hit here. A lot of people went to spring break and at the beaches. And a lot of people have, you know, you might have heard some of the reports, but, you know, the, those who consider themselves more conservative, I consider it nihilist and not conservative. <laughs> um, you know, they'll have these big parties and stuff. I think that's becoming less of a thing, but it became this whole, oh, Democrats are snowflakes and they think that this virus is going to hurt them and it doesn't. I think that is changing now, but that has really divided and slowed down the response to flatten the curve here. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, the uh, spring break thing did come up on the news, but now the mobile testing, were they, um, how, how was that? That was uh, in the parking lot? of the hospitals and and if you if you had symptoms they test you or they test you upon request and did was it private was it how did that work originally it was only if symptoms but i have a a friend who's a nurse who was at one of these and i, I haven't had a chance to talk to her but i've seen a few posts of, of mm -hmm. hers i think they've loosened it up more so that if you if you have symptoms they will do it um but it still seems kind of chaotic there are just not enough tests still um mm -hmm. but they were trying to reserve it for people who were symptomatic and we're all over the place right now on trying to do more than that but they were doing drive 
drive-through stuff. I don't know really the, the details beyond that. And they were they had set this up a few days earlier in Birmingham at UAB, which is the University of Alabama at Birmingham, mm -hmm. which is really this incredible medical complex with a little bit of a university attached to it, kind of, right? I mean, it's it's just this incredible medical center. They've been really pushing to do more, but um, again, I think it's difficult when the political leadership has made it, has sent mixed messages, mm -hmm. which has been harder to mobilize stuff. And then as you know, in the US, the um, medical- did she have to, Sorry, did she have to self-quarantine when she came back? Did they say, oh, she just got self-quarantine? They, didn't. they okay. didn't, yeah, that was a really interesting thing. In fact, mm -hmm. it was crazy. Like when I went through and I've got global entry, right? So, you know, that's just really quick. They didn't even ask me anything. And for her, and she's got a green card, we were expecting more. Um, but they didn't even ask or check anything. It was almost like, yeah, we don't want to touch anything. It was, um, you know, some people had said, oh, she might have to like quarantine, even though she doesn't have symptoms. They weren't doing that at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's, that's how it worked. We were really surprised. It's more like, welcome home. You have a green card at least. Uh, you're good to go. Uh, we don't want to touch you. That's almost what it seemed to be like. Mm. Okay. Yeah. In fact, security seemed laxer um, at that point, point than it usually does. In fact, like when we were going through security in uh, Nicaragua, sometimes they've been weird. Like uh, my son once had two bottles of 50 milliliter bottles of um hot sauce 50 milliliters right so half of the normal and in the plastic bag they threw those out i had a empty rum bottle from my from my wedding uh that my best man had had uh he and i had finished off at the end of the evening and i was bringing back and they were about to get rid of that even though it had no liquids in it <laughs> I explained it, they let me keep it. But the point is, is that usually they're almost crazier than in the US. <clears throat> this time they were like, yeah, don't even take off your shoes. Just put your stuff through the x-ray and you're good to go. So it was very strange. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Wow, yeah. No, it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. So that both both securities have appear to have uh, loosened up a little bit and, and um, so we have a bit of an idea of the response in Alabama and how, 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 how about Mexico? What are you, what's, ha what's happening in Mexico? So, so I think Mexico and, and Nicaragua are somewhat similar in the sense that, um, like, let me back up just for a second. Yeah. In the airport, it's because there were so few people there mm. that things were kind of laxer. We had gone actually flown for several days for to spend several days in corn Island, mm -hmm. which is just off the coast of the Caribbean uh, or the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua. When we arrived and this was before there was any confirmed cases, they were testing the temperature, uh, you know, with the, the, mm -hmm. the um, testing uh, temperature for everyone when they came on the Island. So understand it's not everywhere, but the Island was, was being very, uh, proactive about this. But the Nicaraguan government, which is Daniel Ortega, but he's been AWOL and it likely he suffers some fairly major medical illnesses. People think it's lupus among other things. But his, so his wife, the first lady, um, Rosario Murillo, also known as Lachayo, has been absolutely insane. And she's seeing this as a kind of a plot, the coronavirus is this plot. And so she was even organizing like a big march, love in the time of, of the coronavirus. And, you know, continuing with food fairs and all this other stuff, absolutely insane. So what, what's happened is because a year and a half ago, there were big anti-government demonstrations that have just sort of simmered the anti-government sentiment. That's been, this has been politicized. Mm. And so it's seen as a way, the coronavirus is seen as a way to try and take down the current government. And the response has been completely asinine. But people instead 
have taken things into their own hands again, like panic buying and other stuff and trying to bleach everything. Um, in Mexico, the uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, better known as AMLO, who's the president, who came in as sort of a populist and come, came from originally the left wing of the pre, the, the dominant party for 70 years, he, he has downplayed the coronavirus at, at the beginning and was continuing to go out and shake hands. And he got a lot of flack because he's got a lot of opposition in Mexico from people for a variety of reasons. He had his amulets that he said would protect him from the virus, which was not going over well for most Mexicans, okay? That said, his government has taken steps to do things and they've got a, a uh, Anthony or a, a Fauci similar kind of guy in their health ministry who is well respected and has tried to implement changes and I've got lots of friends in Mexico and they have people have for the most part been trying to implement what they're doing elsewhere in terms of social distancing and taking various precautions including masks mm -hmm. so in a lot of places it's interesting to see how in the absence of government leadership, people are trying to figure things out, sometimes successfully and sometimes not so effectively. And I think that's unfortunately the case in all three of the com com companies we're countries we're talking about right now, the US, Mexico, and Nicaragua. None of them are no New Zealand, none of them are South Korea, which is really unfortunate. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, I'll also say one last thing I was just looking up because you had mentioned the possibility of pandemics at different times in Mexico's responses. Yes. I was looking up, uh, I've got a friend who is about three years ago started doing research on the Spanish influenza in Mexico because most of the research has been done and, and writing on the US and Europe, et cetera, or Canada. And so actually, Mexico was undergoing a revolution between 1910 and 1920, which killed somewhere between one or two million of 15 million people in Mexico during the Mexican Revolution. Well, the Spanish influenza there killed about 300 to 600,000 people in the midst of this. Wow. And so it was on top, which came out, the, you know, the numbers they usually say between 300 and 600,000, my friend thinks it's probably about 500,000. And it goes with the death rate worldwide of between two and 4%. But he's, he, he wrote a pretty good article uh, in a journal called The Americas that came out uh, two years ago, or a year and a half ago in 2019, and uh, talks about that. But it's, but it's interesting as he's looking at the response, both popular and political, you see a lot of um, similarities to, to now in the way people respond, the press responds, the price gouging, um, all this other stuff. It's, it's quite fascinating. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And, and you know why it's called the Spanish flu, right? You tell me your reason. I think I know, but I, I'd love to hear yours. Well, it, it, primarily during World War I, and Spain wasn't involved in the war, so they didn't suppress their press. So the press was free in, in Spain, and so they were talking about all these people getting the flu. Well, the combatants in World War I were like, well, we don't want any bad press about people getting sick at home. It's all about our victories on the front. And so the world was like, my goodness, look at what's going on in Spain, because we keep talking about these people getting sick. Spanish flu. That's, that's, yeah, it's, it was uncensored. The press was yeah. uncensored. Yeah, no, that's it. And the Spanish king, Alfonso 13, yeah, at he the got time. Sick, yeah, he? which is, yeah, isn't that crazy? And I mean, I grew up hearing about the Spanish influenza and I never knew why, but that's, uh, so you get tagged with that just for having an open press. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> yes. No, absolutely. <laughs> Frank will put a stop to that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> no Spanish flu too. No. And uh, I guess there's a movement down there for this to be the China flu. Yes. Um, <laughs> I've got a couple of Facebook friends who are like, well, it's from China. So blah, blah, blah. And it's like, 
dude. So how about the swine flu? Yeah. Do we call that the U.S. flu because it started here in our agri industrial agricultural business? Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, it's from there, so you should call it that. It's like, no, it's actually just really racist, and you don't do it that way. Um, and don't you understand how it's feeding in? But yeah, because what it is is it's all about putting the blame game. And, it, mm -hmm. and as I keep saying, it doesn't matter where it's from. Mm -hmm. What are you doing about now? And so it's a way to deflect. You'll, it's certainly something that's coming from what I'll just call amorphously the right. It's to defend Trump so you can say, well, forget about me. Blame China. And, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the response is, doesn't matter if it started in China, if China is culpable. Um, I mean, sure, they hid uh the spread originally but how is that any different than what you're doing dudes by calling it a hoax when we knew um better and so it's really fascinating how you have this instead of a pragmatic response it's this very political mm -hmm. instead of saying okay what do we do now it's this trying to attribute blame instead of dealing with the issue at hand which is where do you go from here which is really worrying um we'll see how it goes how does it work with the U.S. hospitals? You have private care and you have county hospitals, I believe, and you can get free care in county. So if you're poor and in the U.S. in Alabama, which I imagine is probably more right wing than than say Washington State and right. and, and and such things, and and you fell ill uh, right now, what 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 happens? Because even though I was in Dallas for a little while, I never understood the hospital system too well because they had they had the county hospital and a lot of the surgeons would go there because it's great for trauma experience right and they said well they kind of donate their time i'm like yeah but that's a fraction of the cost of running a hospital where does the money come from yeah yeah this has exposed how bad the public health care system is uh -huh. and also the for-profit um care industry which i think there's a place for mm -hmm. but it's so fractured here it's problematic because well first of all you know, the way it goes now in this system of not having a strong federal response is everybody's competing each other. So you've got the federal government, which can outbid everyone. Then you've got rich states like California and New York who can outbid, you know, smaller uh, or less well-off states. But then you've got cities and individual hospitals who have to bid as well. So, so as you're pointing out that the wealth inequalities here are, are a problem. So, and then to get more to your issue in general. So in the US, a hospital is not allowed to turn somebody away officially, like you're supposed to pay for it. But again, the problem that there are so many people without healthcare or mm -hmm. decent healthcare means that those hospitals have to foot the bill for that. And because those county hospitals, even though they get public money, they can sort of do okay. What the real problem is, is the rural hospitals, many of which are private and have been running in the red and they, they've relied on subsidies from the state government. They're really getting it really hit hard and they've had problems in the past 15, 20 years with them closing. And now that's even accelerating more because many of their customer base because they're rural and tends to be poor is they don't have insurance so they're having to provide this care and with the coronavirus all these hospitals are frequently doing this care without having proper compensation and so and they're having to postpone elective surgeries where they make their money and so all these hospitals are going further in the red hospital administrators who are already especially in the for-profit ones are all about trimming costs. So they've been really bad about making sure that doctors, nurses, cleaning staff, etc., have proper PPE. And so it's really just exposed how really messed up this system is, having it based on for care because, yeah, I mean, those county hospitals or those rural hospitals People don't have another option, but it is a real different level of care and they're doing their best, but the employees don't have the equipment they need to keep themselves safe. 
and the hospitals themselves are not getting the revenue stream they need to make this long term viable and it, it's crazy. It, the reason why you never understood it or had a good sense is because it really makes no sense. Mm. Um, like you try and explain, like as a Canadian, you try and say, look, if everyone's got insurance people, then the hospitals, you get compensated. Mm. Why are you working? Like you'll hear lots of people who worked in hospitals who tend to be political or these people being politically conservative and including lots of doctors. And I'd say, well, They'd complain about people not paying, but they didn't want everyone having insurance, so like expanding Medicaid and things like that. And I'd say, well, don't you want to get paid? And you try to explain to them the Canadian and other systems, and it just, it just doesn't sink in. It's really bizarre. I don't know if this is going to change that. Mm -hmm. I really don't know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's hard to understand because it makes no sense. And how is it in Nicaragua? Because Ortega was very left. Did he nationalize the hospitals and how are they coping? See, that's one of the misunderstandings about Ortega yeah. and the Sandinistas. Yeah. That they, yes, they were left in a sense, but really what it was is if you watched, they didn't nationalize as much as often thought. I know we were talking yeah. about the milk stuff, but actually yeah. they didn't. What they did was they tried to, to work in sort of a capitalist system. If you go down to Nicaragua now, that's savage capitalism, dude. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's not nationalize this, nationalize that. But what they did was they tried to put a social justice component. I think there's a big difference between the Sandinistas of the 1980s, and Ortega was obviously a big part of that, versus Ortega in 2006, 2007 coming back. Mm -hmm. What they did, so when it comes to healthcare, though, mm -hmm. so there is a fairly robust public health care system, and I've seen this working, right? Now, no, it's not the same as the same level of facility and infrastructure as maybe Canada and others, but given the size of the GDP per capita of Nicaragua, and if you compare it to its Central American neighbors, it's actually a pretty good system, and the doctors are quite excellent. Many of them were trained in Cuba and elsewhere, and my own experience with my wife's family and a couple of experiences myself was like, wow, mm -hmm. give these guys some more money and they're pretty good. But they actually have pretty good cancer care, et cetera. At the same time, there are also private clinics and private hospitals mm. who are quite reasonably priced for people from Canada or the US based on your salaries. But people use, like my wife's family uses a mixture of both. And there also, your medical insurance is based on you being employed. It's provided by the government, but you need to be contributing to what's called the INSS, I-N-S-S, which is their combination social security, which includes health care, as well as your retirement pension. So it's, it's actually a half decent for a country that size. It's got a better medical infrastructure than Honduras or El Salvador or Guatemala. But I don't know how it's going to play out with the specifics if this mm -hmm. gets really bad down there. And, and, and is it similar in Mexico uh, to Nicaragua or is it a little? I, I think it's better funded and yeah. they have IMSS, um, which, which is the public insurance through employment, et cetera. But there are also private doctors and private hospitals as well. And I think it depends on where you are, kind of like in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got a, a system, and yes, in Canada, it's broken up and run by province as well after a national standard that's supposed to be given. In, in Mexico, if you are you're better off in certain areas of Mexico than you are in other others. Mm -hmm. So in mm -hmm. some place, cases, it's undoubtedly a bit of a joke. In other places, it's quite good. And I know a couple of people who are doctors in Mexico and part of the IMSS system. And I know they do a pretty good job. And they have, I think, uh, there's more money in the system for healthcare in Mexico. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So they're... 
they're probably doing doing okay. So as your daily life in um, in Alabama, there you're able to uh, go online with your students, and 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 you and you're teaching undergrads or grads or teaching undergrads. I've got oh. two classes um, huh. and between 30 and 40 students in each. Uh -huh. And uh, many of them have gone home. So yeah. we're doing this all online. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really just, it's, it's hard because I don't really do Zoom as much and things like that. And also both my classes had gotten to a point where I'd done, I'd been heavy on lectures and I was saving the end of the class for book discussions. Mm -hmm. And doing a couple of assignments at the end based on that. So actually, I can I pretty well just set them up to do their own reading. I send them uh, notes and things like that, or things to think about, mm -hmm. and then they're going from there. So I just have to catch up on grading. But my classes are easy easy to transfer. However, I'm teaching an, a course for the interim semester, which is three weeks in May, three hours a day. I had it set up as a Mexican history through film. You know, because no one wants to listen to me three hours a day, five days a week, etc. Um, now I have to try and figure out how to adapt that online because I have to make sure that students all have access to movies. Like, does everyone have Netflix? Does everyone like? I'm looking at databases, so I need to to kind of now adapt that uh, big time. And uh, but really, I'm 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 also really concerned, even though UA is more affluent as a whole than many other schools. I mean, it's not Yale, but you know, people, it's a mix of, of students, but you do have people who it is more difficult, who are definitely working class, making sure that they have access to the internet and also the ability to type up a paper. So it's not just on a phone, you know, it's, um, and, and several students have had issues with family members who have come down with this. And um, yeah, it's just been a strange experience. But, but here, Joel, I mean, we go out for walks because there's no one around. Like we go around the VA, the Veterans Administration Hospital, and there's a community center. You walk for 40 minutes, you see one other person. Oh, and really? So, so I'm going out because I'm going to go insane if I stay inside. Yeah. And, and you can do it. So this is actually a good place to, to be to have to deal with quarantine. Uh-huh. So they're taking the self-isolation very seriously. It, it depends on where you are. Again, in these kind of, yeah. well, people don't walk here anyways. That's why Alabama <laughs> has such high obesity and diabetes rates, right? <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> but the football's not on. I mean, and, and and there's only so many episodes of Tiger King, and then That's then right. what? <laughs> <laughs> so, but I I mean, honestly, this is for me. I there there are a lot worse places to be than here, and it's mm -hmm. pretty um, pretty easy going. It's not like I am in a larger urban area or like even like Vancouver. The housing you're spread out more. It is, one could argue that much of, especially post-World War II designed U.S. communities that are based on car culture are perfectly designed for social distancing. Yes. So, yeah. 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 You're not on top of each other. Right. At all. And so when you're out and you see that other person, they're, they aren't wearing the mask per se. The mask um, in public isn't, isn't prevalent or is it? It, it is becoming more prevalent now. Yeah. And one of the grocery stores just sent an email and I think it is changing uh, or this is going to become the comment. They have said that all of their staff will be wearing masks. They're also putting plexi plexiglass shields on and uh -huh. making contactless uh, credit card payments, but also that all customers must now have a mask to go in. Ah. So I think all the grocery stores are moving that way, especially if they have, you know, they have to worry about their employees, both to make sure they're still working, but also employees threatening to probably quit unless there are better protections for them. I mean, many of the stores, in fact, I think all of them have already gone down to first, it was only allowing in 40% of their capacity. Now it's down to 20%. And they've got, you know, 
big spaces in grocery checkout lines um, where you're supposed to stay, stay so you're not as close to the next person. And outside they have it to restrict people coming in. Although, mm -hmm. to be honest, I haven't yet been in a store where there's been a lineup to get in. There's mm -hmm. been somebody checking, but it's just been like, go on in. And, uh, and they're wiping down all of the buggy handles, like the employees are doing that. So they've done pretty good. I think they've taken pretty good steps um, for at, at the grocery stores, at least. Have you been to a Walmart? I have. And are they doing that in the Walmart? Yes. Okay, because the Walmart here in Richmond, they weren't doing it. They were doing it at the Safeway. They are doing it at the F Freshco. They are doing it, and then the Walmart was just a gong show. Now, that can change hourly, but if, as of a, a few days ago, it wasn't. And this, you know, is, this is Richmond, B.C., where people are wound up. And uh, it was, so I was just like, okay, so th that's, that's good to hear that it's not perhaps a store thing. It just might be the manager here's... Uh, not, I, not tuned I think so. And I've only been once to the Walmart in Richmond and I went, wow, it is so different in Canada. And it was just so insane and so packed. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it also helps there are fewer people out here. Mm -hmm. And, but also, no, Walmart has uh, been pretty aggressive actually and a pretty good corporate citizen in terms of responding to this. So I, I certainly give them credit for that. And uh, oh yeah, you're, you're in the homeland of Walmart, isn't it? From uh, right. Well, yeah. it's it, no, it's from Arkansas. Oh, Arkansas. Pardon Arkansas, me. Arkansas. Yeah. 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 But I mean, it, so you put it, up with it, them. It, sorry. You put up with them. Yeah. Exactly. From Arkansas. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Walmart has its place. Uh, I do have my issues with it on a lot, but uh -huh. and actually to get some of my my uh, products from Mexico. Walmart does knows its clientele and uh, stocks up pretty well. So, and surprisingly, they've had the best produce um, since mm. this has started. So, now they've got lots of fields and agriculture in um, Alabama, and right. it's an issue here because we can't import the Mexicans to work in the fields, and and so they're talking about the crops up here. What about the crops down there? So Alabama has a does need uh, workers, and most of them are coming from Mexico and Central America. And so there's this real at odds with the Trump administration's stance on on cracking down. Because if you notice, most of the representatives, the Republicans from rural districts, are not. If it, they're agricultural, they're not big fans of shutting things down. And in fact. The Trump administration is now looking at loosening restrictions on visas so that people can come in because uh, in Alabama, uh, especially in places like Florida, especially in the, like in this region, they're having a heck of a time. But the Trump administration just said that they're going to lower the wages, re minimum wages required for uh, agricultural workers to help out the agricultural companies. And you're going... That's not going to get. That's not going to get Americans off their couches. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> it's insane. But that, but that is an issue, and I think that's one thing to keep in um, keep in mind as we move forward. And obviously, you guys are doing that in Canada, is to see whether those food distribution systems and the whole uh, supply chain will continue. I mean, it's been pretty effective here. Um, you know, toilet paper is, is back and available. I don't think you can find any hand sanitizer, but um, mm -hmm. the, the toilet paper is the, the, I went to a Walmart actually about a week and a half ago and it was stocked to the gills. So uh, that is coming around. And generally most things like you'll see shelves emptied out, but then the next day they'll be refilled. Um, so it's mm -hmm. not, it's been pretty good here compared to other parts of the U S mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to actually crops, yeah. Uh, getting field hands is even harder than it was before in part because of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Food security. It's uh, can, yeah, it can become a bit of a big issue. Now up here on this last point, um, yep. dentists, we're having a hard time encouraging our staff to come and work 
because they're scared of yep. all that's going on, but they're also, they've got great benefits. Now the government's brought in great benefits. So, uh, as a small business owner, it's not necessarily a hardship for the employees to go on EI because they brought it in real quick. They've dropped a lot of the restrictions. Like, okay, you can't work. Um, I know you're in the university system, but what's your knowledge of small businesses in, um, you know, Alabama? Cause I imagine they don't have a robust EI, but I could be wrong. Uh, you're absolutely correct. There's not a robust EI yeah. um, because in the South, but also most other states, um, to be unemployed means that you're a failure. And because everything is so racially coded, even though there are more poor whites, the idea is that it's blacks and Latinos who somehow get unemployment insurance or unemployment benefits. So, and you've seen it's always been that way, at least for decades and decades, right? And the move in the US, you've seen more and more states moving even more punitive. Um, Rick Scott in Florida, this has been in the news recently. Before he became senator, he put in a new unemployment uh, claim system, spent mm -hmm. $78 million, and it was specifically designed to make it more difficult and less efficient. I mean, they cr actually create the system to be less efficient, to make it even more miserable for you. So now you've got all these systems that were already inefficient and they're just overloaded. So they can't handle, even though the federal government in the bailout package provided better benefits and that money would go to the states, that would then provide those benefits on top of the regular to, to have a higher percentage. People are having an incredibly difficult time simply registering for EI. Mm -hmm. And then there was this big money that was supposed to go to the Small Business Administration. So Congress approves that money. But the way the system works is the money goes to the banks and actually, well, the Labor Department um, and it, it's, it's, it's difficult to understand because I would think it would be the Small Business Administration, but there's also the Labor Department that is tied in with this. They have to release the funds to banks and they actually are the ones who are supposed to ride herd on the banks to make sure that they pay out. What's happened is that many of those banks have not gotten money or they seem to not be moving very quickly to register people. So I've got a friend, uh, the owner of Left Hand Soap Company, which is fantastic in Tuscaloosa. Um, she's been trying, she's been, she's a super, super thoughtful and very even keeled person. And she's just been having a heck of a time with uh, the bank. Bank of America has supposedly been the best for this but it's been really difficult for small business owners to actually get that money is as well quickly so they can keep people on payroll, et cetera. So I think really you're just seeing a, a problem with a U.S. system that has been moving towards privatizing or showing that it's inefficiency because of a very strong anti-government sentiment in a large part of the American populace. As I say to my students, the US is the only country where you have people who say, or politicians who say, the government doesn't work. Elect me and I'll prove it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. You it can is do that for a coach for the football team. <laughs> And, and you know, you may have heard that everyone's supposed to get uh, supposedly twelve hundred bucks um, a person for adults and five hundred for kids, up to a certain uh, income level. Mm -hmm. Well, again, to show you how this punitive level goes, because if the whole point of this is to provide stimulus to the economy and get people spending money, right, and those at the lower end spend all of it. I mean, somebody who makes $250,000 a year, well, they aren't going to get much from that at all. But still, if they receive it, they'll just put it in their bank account, right? One of the things when it comes to like undocumented workers, if you use, many people don't file tax returns. 
Hmm. But people who don't have green cards yet, they might actually be legal, but they don't have green cards yet. They will file just to actually file their taxes, use a temporary tax ID number. And so you don't have a social security number, but you have a temporary tax ID number. So it serves as a replacement for your social security number when you file your tax return. Okay. So for example, my wife had that while we were applying and getting her green card. So last year's tax return had that. Well, in the package for the bailout package, the Republicans put it in that if anybody in a household didn't have a social security number, even if they were there legally, nobody, no money would be sent at all. So if you had two adults with social security numbers filing with three kids, but one of them didn't have the social security number, instead of getting two times 1200, two times 500, which would be, or three times 500, which would be 2400, 1500, so we're at 3900, the family would get zero. Wow. So even though I've got a social security number, even though I've paid, if they base it on last year's taxes, we would get zero. Wow. And so you see this weird punitive level, Boeing gets 17 billion for killing two plane loads of people and knowing exactly that they were likely to kill people. Yeah. They're going to get 17 billion or so. It's really a bizarre thing. Um, and, and so I don't know what to say. Canada has done a much better job of being far more just and intelligent in making sure people get money to minimize the economic impact um, on the country. There's too much here with class, with race, all these politicized things, which really takes away from an effective, pragmatic solution. And really just, I mean, from a macro point of view, any economist would look at this and say, this is insanity. Right, right. And then with a pandemic, it just amplifies it. And so it'll be interesting to see how it, how it plays out in the U.S. Because November, we could still be in weird times. Yep. How do you, how do you go vote? Well, there are actually solutions. And, and one of them is the, uh, you could have rolling like a two-week election. Like, they do like in, in India, places. right? And, and then, yeah, yeah. And then also mail-in ballots. But, you know, uh, even though many expats and about 2 million U.S. service members and diplomats use that every election, um, Trump, to prepare for that, said that um, that's fraudulent and mm. you shouldn't do it even though that's what we've done. So it's going to be weird. There are solutions. And mm -hmm. as I say to people here, uh, not to everyone, I'm not like I'm yelling it around, but I said, yeah. why do you guys always say no? I thought the U S used to be the country that was like, can do, we can, we can, we can do it. It's a very interesting way to see how this, this country has turned into, if there's any change. It's like, nope, that's too challenging. Can't do it. And you say, but there are models of this all around the world. Why don't you just look at them and see how you could adapt it to yours? Nope, can't do it. It's it's really disturbing. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. Um, yeah. The politics and 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 the different things. But the the encouraging bit is, it seems like the the average people on the ground and the the companies are behaving. Um, and and the. Uh, Politics aside, it seems like uh, we're all fairly similar and the message is coming home. And yeah, hopefully, there's, yeah. there's, yeah, we got to help your wife with her tooth there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. no. I, and I do want to make sure that, that it's uh, to reinforce yeah. what you just said. There are a lot of good people who want yeah. who are doing good things. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, we're going to get out the other end of here and, there are obviously going to be a lot of people who are going to die as well. But uh, as a historian, I'll have to say, I'm grateful this isn't the 16th century in the Americas after the Europeans arrive, because that morbidity rate uh, makes this even or seem less. But, you know, as I say to people, and they said, oh, it's only a 2%, maybe a 1% mortality rate. And I said, 
the U.S. has 330 million people. Are you good with 3.3 million people dying? Yeah. And, uh, but, but I, I do think that there's a lot of reasons for uh, cause for optimism here. Yeah. As long as people do what they're supposed to. So we'll see how, what happens. Yeah. It's, yeah. 3.3 is in that like Vermont, like, okay, let's just nuke Vermont. How do you uh, feel about yeah. America now? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I think Alabama is about 6 million. So yeah. we could do half of Alabama as long as it's not me. As long as I'm the Crimson Tide group, right? <laughs> That's right. As long as it's only Auburn and the War or like their thing instead of World Tide is uh, War Eagle. So War uh, Eagle, there we go. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, it'll it'll be interesting. Yeah. Um, oh, one last fun fact for you. Yes. So Alabama does, despite being a absolute state that's crazy for for U.S. football, right? Yeah. They've never had a pro team. The reason yeah. why, not that there was an interest because of the football mania, but Bear Bryant, the famous coach, worked very hard with the Auburn uh, coaches as well to make sure no professional football team came in. So it would always be an Alabama-Auburn ra- rivalry is the dominant. So, yeah, call it college ball. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, well, when I was in Dallas, the the football aficionados and they're mad in for football in in Texas. They said the actual better ball is college ball, and the NFL's a bit of a circus for them. So they were like, the aficionados watch college ball. So perhaps he was looking after your best interests. Perhaps, yeah. perhaps, perhaps, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I imagine if they had an NFL team in Alabama, it would be would be sold out pretty quick. Yeah. I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. Just what colors would they be? I, I'm trying to think of if you had crimson and orange uniting Auburn and Alabama, and that just sounds horrific. They almost sound like the Canucks from the 80s. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> a big ugly V. <laughs> Those were the worst colors ever. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're so bad. They're awesome now. <laughs> Where's the brown? We need more brown. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 And the Cleveland Browns, isn't that orange or am I just colorblind? You know, it is kind of. Yeah. 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 But I don't really care about Cleveland, so it no. doesn't matter. Well, most people don't. I don't think. <laughs> no one don't. Mind. Yeah. <laughs> well, Stephen, this is absolutely wonderful. That was uh, great chatting with you.